utmost pleasure that I'm introducing Dr. Dale Abel. Dr. Dale Abel is currently the Chair and Department Executive Officer of the Department of Internal Medicine and University of Iowa. He is the Director of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism and the Director of their Diabetes Research Center. Dr. Abel serves as a Professor of Medicine, of Biochemistry, and of Biomedical Engineering. He's originally from Jamaica, where he obtained his medical degree, then obtained a PhD in physiology at Oxford University. He completed internal medicine residency as served and served as chief medical resident at Northwestern University, and then completed fellowship training in endocrinology and metabolism at Harvard's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Abel is the recipient of numerous awards for scholarship, mentorship, and research, Overall, he has close to 100 national and international recognitions, honors, awards, and outstanding achievements. Through his distinguished research career in endocrine and metabolism, he has pioneered work on glucose transport and mitochondrial metabolism in the heart, which guides his current research interests, molecular mechanisms responsible for cardiovascular complications of diabetes. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Dale Abel as he gives his talk today on diabetes and heart failure, mechanisms, and clinical challenges. Thank you very much for that um, very warm and somewhat not deserved introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be uh, giving the uh, Lawrence um, Fishman lecture this, this afternoon. And as this is Medical Grand Rounds, um, I figure that the, 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 the residents are over there. I met a few of you earlier as I got you to sit closer to the front. And so the faculty are here. So, so um, my, my, my hope is that I will speak on something that's you know, very, very, very topical to things that you're seeing on the ward. So I'm going to talk about heart failure uh, in, in, in diabetes. This is medical grand round. So a long time ago, I did some consulting for Nova Nordisk and Pfizer. That was more than two years ago. So I don't think it's a relevant conflict at this point. Um, I will not be discussing any unapproved use of any, um, any agents, but I will be talking about some peer-reviewed and published clinical trial results um, as, as it relates to um, glucose lowering agents and, and diabetes. So the reason why diabetes um, remains uh, a critical challenge um, in internal medicine and in society in general are its complications. And you know, it is not lost in this audience that um, there are major complications of diabetes such as blindness, um, diabetic nephropathy and diabet diabetic neuropathy, classic microvascular complications um, of diabetes. However, what drives most of the mortality in diabetes are microvascular complications um, of, of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Stated in another way, um, diabetes amplifies cardiovascular risk. And what this slide is summarizing are um, the results of many um, studies that really, um, irrespective of the nature of the cardiovascular complication, there's about a twofold increase in risk. Um, for individuals who happen to have diabetes. Now, when one thinks about diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, which, as you know, um, comprises about 95% of all diabetes, it really, the link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease is multifactorial, and multiple um, defects really conspire to damage the, the cardiovascular system as summarized here, ranging from um, not only just hyperglycemia, but abnormal lipids, hypertension, insulin resistance, inflammation, um, altered fibrinolysis, um, endothelial dysfunction, et cetera, which then ultimately will um, conspire to increase um, vascular disease and ultimately increase the risk of um, cardiovascular disease. Now, for those of you who are um, history buffs, um, you know, diabetes mellitus basically means uh, sweet pea. And, and historically, you diagnosed it by the fact that it was somebody who was making a lot of urine, but, but it, was, it was sweet. Now, we, we don't do that anymore um, in modern medicine, but historically, you know, diabetes was really viewed as a, a glucose-centric disorder, and therefore the, the, the notion then of reducing diabetic complications was one of shall we normalize blood glucose to actually see if the complications go away? Now, clearly, that's true, um, very true, in fact, in type 1 diabetes and, and microvascular complications. But whether or not that's true for macrovascular complications in diabetes, um, 
for many years wasn't clear. So when I was an endocrine fellow, it wasn't clear. And then a series of trials came out um, summarized in this, on this slide, which are large um, trials of tight control in type 2 diabetes, looking at hard endpoints, either all-cause mortality or cardiovascular death. And at the end of the day, these results were actually a bit disappointing, because what they suggested was that um, aggressive lowering of blood glucose in type 2 diabetics might not necessarily translate to less cardiovascular disease. And in fact, in one of, these, one of the trials, the ACCORD study, there was in fact a signal for increased mortality and increased cardiovascular death. So as a consequence of that, um, about a decade ago now, the FDA and also the um, European Medical Society mandated that all new therapies for diabetes should undergo a rigorous assessment of cardiovascular safety through large-scale outcomes trials. Now, as you all know, there are, we have a, a, a multiplication of therapies now for um, type 2 diabetes in multiple classes with multiple mechanisms of action um, summarized here in this slide. Um, there are you know, GLP-1 receptor agonists or um, drugs that um, inhibit the degradation of GLP-1. There are thiazolidinediones that act primarily on um, uh, PPAR gamma receptors in adipose tissue. There are drugs that act on the kidney to increase glycosuria, which for an endocrinologist, that was a real challenge initially because you know, we tried to prevent glycosuria, and now we are making glycosuria worse, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but there are multiple agents now um, that are approved for diabetes, and many of these have gone through rigorous um, cardiovascular outcomes trials. So this is a table from uh, a review by Simeon Taylor that looked at a number of agents that have gone through um, various trials. And this, this table summarizes multiple classes. There's a TCD here. Um, there are uh, DPP-4 inhibitors here, SGLT um, inhibitors here, um, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and even bromocryptine. And if you just look all the way over here at this um, endpoint for most trials, which is a major, major adverse cardiovascular um, events, you can see that the picture is, is mixed in the sense that some agents, in fact, um, statistically reduce these, um, the, 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 these events. So, for example, these two are with the SGLT2 um, inhibitors shown here. These are, this data is looking at um, two GLP-1 receptor agonists, and even pyoglitazone um, in a practice study reduced major adverse cardiovascular um, outcomes. But there are other agents, for example, some of the um, DP4, DPP-4 inhibitors that, in fact, um, were neutral um, with regards to major adverse cardiovascular endpoints. And this is a composite endpoint of um, an ischemic event or a stroke or a cardiovascular-related death. Now, um, there, are current, there are certain limitations of some of these um, large outcomes trials, and this was a nice um, summary by Will Seffelo of the ADA that was published um, last year in um, Diabetes Care. And really, I think there are a few points that I think are important to make here, is that many of these trials, individuals are very rigorously selected for entry into the trials, and um, there is still the question as to how generalizable are these cardiovascular outcomes to um, larger populations, um, that these are short trials, and oftentimes we don't really know, or let's put it another way, it probably takes sometimes decades for you know, cardiovascular d disease to develop, and whether or not a short trial is, is sufficient to fully understand the effect of these agents um, is, is unclear. And then a big issue is that many of these, th these trials are designed to compare one agent to um, standard care. Um, and oftentimes, the glycemic goals might be different. But also, even if the glycemic goals are matched, sometimes they're matched by escalating other therapies in the other arm. And so a benefit in one arm could reflect a true effect of that agent or could reflect an adverse effect of what's being done on the other arm to, to maintain the same level of glycemia. So I think that's something that's really important to bear in mind as one looks at these trials and one attempts to interpret what these trials mean. But let me just show you a couple of representative results from some of these recent trials just to kind of give you a flavor as to what's, what's known. And what I've done here on this slide is to summarize um, at a high level the results of trials with DPP-4 inhibitors versus GLP-1 receptor agonists versus SGLT-2 um, inhibitors. Um, as summarized here. So with regards to uh, DPP-4 in, in inhibitors, 
the, the kind of the high level summary is that the majority of these really had no net effect, positive or, ben, or, or negative, on cardiovascular outcomes. So in a sense, you can say that's good, at least the drug isn't killing people. But then at the same time, you aren't necessarily preventing or lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, I'll make a note here, because I'll come back to this in a second, that one of these trials, this, the Sabertimid trial with saxagliptin, did have a signal for an increased risk of heart failure hospitalizations in individuals who were randomized to saxagliptin. With regards to GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, again, it varies by, by agent. Um, so for example, with lixacenatide, um, there really was no, or, or exenatide, there's really no clear difference in CV endpoints. However, um, liraglutide and semaglutide did reduce the composite endpoint of cardiovascular deaths, um, non-fatal MI, or, or stroke. And then the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, empagliflozin and canagliflozin, both um, were associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular um, events. So with that background, I'm going to pivot now to talk really for the rest of the time about heart failure. And I'd like to um, leave you with the, the thought that heart failure is another diabetes complication. And I would say it's probably an unrecognized complication of diabetes. And if you think about heart failure from a prognostic standpoint, I find this as a very ominous slide. So this slide, people here are going, in, going into oncology. There's a lot of cancer to the left of heart failure. And, um, you know, the survival from many of these um, cancers actually is better. And in fact, this is an older slide. Some of these numbers are probably lower now than heart failure, which once it's diagnosed, tends to have a fairly grim long-term prognosis, even with um, optimized therapy. Now, if you look at the prevalence and incidence of heart failure in the context of, of diabetes, and this is a study that was published a few years ago looking um, across the age spectrum at prevalence and incidence of diabetes, what you can see very clearly is that at all ages, diabetes increases the risk of heart failure, um, both, both in terms of the, uh, the, of the prevalence and, uh, and, the, and the new diagnoses which, 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 which take place. And it roughly doubles the risk, and in some studies even triples the risk um, of, of heart failure. An interesting analysis of this particular data set I thought was actually quite informative. Now, if you look at the things that um, predicted the risk of the increased risk of, of heart failure in diabetes, a few things came out. So some are obvious. Um, ischemic heart disease, renal failure, hypertension certainly would increase the likelihood of heart failure if you had diabetes. Insulin use also increase the likelihood of heart failure if you are diabetic. And I'm going to come back to that because insulin use could, could mean a couple of things. It could mean that, well, your disease is more long-standing, more severe, therefore you're more likely to be on insulin. Um, we have evidence from the lab that hyperinsulinemia may also have a deleterious effect on the heart once it starts to fail. But then the other thing which nobody really understands is that if you're a woman and you're diabetic, your risk for heart failure is actually greater and if you're a man with, 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 with diabetes. I think this is a, a, a wide open question in terms of what's the basis for the sex difference in heart failure risk if you compare individuals with diabetes or not. Now, the other thing which I think is important to, to bear in mind is that if you look at the population prevalence of diabetes, which ranges anywhere from 9 to 13 percent, depending on where you are in, in, in the US, and just hold that number, and then you just go on ward rounds and just ask and look at all your patients with heart failure and you ask how many of those have diabetes, it goes up. So this is a very nice study um, that looked at uh, a large number of Medicare patients um, and looked at the, the presence or absence of heart failure or diabetes. And they looked both at heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or borderline EF or preserved ejection fraction and across the spectrum of heart failure, between 40 and 47% of patients who were hospitalized with heart failure happened to have diabetes. So again, this hopefully will kind of convince you that um, this is a condition that's very, very much enriched um, within the uh, diabetic population. Diabetes also worsens the outcomes of patients with existing heart failure. Here's one example, again, from Justin um, Chugai's work where they, they looked at people who had heart failure and then met the criteria for implantation of an implantable cardio, uh, uh, implantable defibrillator, 
um, and looked at their outcomes. And the um, blue line are the diabetics, the red line are the non-diabetics, and this is a plot of survival. And you can see over time that um, the, despite equivalent therapy, survival was worse in the indi individuals um, with diabetes. So the question then is, you know, can glucose control or poor glucose control increase the risk of diabetes, number one, and number two, does um, normalizing glucose, in fact, prevent the risk of heart failure in the context of diabetes? So this is a, a, a meta-analysis that was published a few years ago, looking at many trials, um, looking at the relationship between glycemic control and heart failure. And most trials, except for one, really indicated that hyperglycemia or poor control was positively correlated with the risk of heart failure in a diabetic um, population. So the question then is, um, what is the impact of glycemic control and heart failure outcomes? So I showed you in a few slides the, 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 the results of some of the initial tight control studies in, um, in diabetes. As the, and again, in those studies, the endpoints were cardiovascular death, acute MIs or stroke, or a composite. Um, but subsequently, um, uh, this group went back and looked at heart failure risk in these trials. And again, asked the question, um, did intensive glucose control versus standard glucose control increase or decrease the risk of heart failure hospitalization? So the way you read this is that if you fall to the left of this line, then intensive control actually is worse. If you fall to the right of this line, in, um, normal control is better. <coughs> Essentially, studies are hovering over the line and, if anything, kind of moving to the left of the line, that these studies suggested that um, with the agents used in these trials, which essentially um, were TZDs, insulin, sulfonylurea, um, as the, the agents to tighten the control primarily, really were, if anything, not making heart failure better and, and if in, in, in some cases actually increasing the risk of heart failure hospitalization. I'm going to show you another study that, that was um, published a few years ago of, of, a, of a class of drugs that never actually made it to market, although in theory, they would, have been a, they would have been beautiful drugs. So remember that um, thiazolidine dions, or TZDs, work by activating PPER gamma, a nuclear receptor in, a, in adipose tissue, that then promotes the secretion of <coughs> adipokines like adiponectin that increases insulin sensitivity. And um, PPR alpha, which is the, another nuclear receptor that fibrates work on, will then reduce triglycerides. Remember that type 2 diabetes is associated with hyperglycemia and dyslipidemia. So if you had a drug that would lower triglycerides and lower glucose, then you'd be kind of hitting two of the metabolic disturbances that are associated with um, type 2 diabetes. So a number of companies actually created compounds that were dual PPAR gamma, PPAR alpha agonists. This is one of them, um, um, aliglitazar. And this was um, published back in 2014, um, looking at uh, a cardiovascular outcomes trial. Now, let's go back a slide. There we go. Right. So, very nice hemoglobin A1C lowering, nice increase in HDL cholesterol, beautiful lowering of triglycerides. LDL cholesterol did go up, um, but the trial was halted because um, people were getting cardiovascular event, and there was an increased risk of heart failure um, hospitalizations in this study, and it was halted, and in fact, this whole, this whole program as a therapeutic class was, 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 was stopped because the CV signal was really too unsafe, despite you know, beautiful metabolic effects, both on glucose as well as on lipids. So let me talk a little bit about um, the DPP, DPP4 inhibitors, which have also been subject to um, a lot of cardiovascular outcomes trials. So this is a slide from the um, saver timid trial that looked at saxagliptin, um, a DPP-4 inhibitor, looking again at heart failure hospitalizations. And what you can see here on those individuals who were randomized to saxagliptin, that actually quite early from the time of randomization, there's already a signal that was evident of increased hospitalizations for heart failure in individuals who were um, randomized to that drug. And if one looks at, across multiple studies for multiple agents, again, um, the Sabertimus study is here, but the other ones really are falling, if anything, off to the 
normal, you know, the, the usual control and not really over in terms of favoring um, DPP4 um, in, in inhibitors. And similarly, then, you know, we you ask the question why? I mean, this is a, these are agents that are maintain their glucose lowering in, in their glucose lowering effect by inhibiting the degradation of GLP-1, which then acts on the beta cell to increase um, glucose-mediated insulin secretion. So as a mechanism of action, it's actually a nice drug because it doesn't make you hypoglycemic, et cetera. But it's an enzyme, it inhibits an enzyme that has other, other, other peptide targets. And so what we don't know is that are there other peptide targets that are normally um, degraded by DPP-4, that when you inhibit DPP-4, they then accumulate within the circulation. And could these have um, GLP-1 independent effects that ultimately may offset any potential cardiovascular benefit of um, this particular class of agents? Then, of course, there are the SGLT-2 inhibitors. And as I said earlier, um, I struggled as an endocrinologist to accept or to embrace this class of agents because <laughs> When I was much younger, the way that you diagnosed diabetes was by dipping a dipstick in, glu in, in somebody's urine, and there was glucose. And then everything that we did therapeutically was to have that dipstick be nothing, right? And so here comes a class of agents that actually works by inhibiting the ability of the kidney to actually reabsorb glucose. So you actually are making your glycosuria worse. And I struggled with that for a long time, because as an endocrinologist, my job was to prevent glycosuria. Anyway, that said, um, everybody was really quite stunned when the first report came out of empagliflozin and cardiovascular outcomes that was published a couple years ago. And this is some, some data from that paper. Um, and it, this is showing the primary outcome of um, all-cause um, mortality. This is cardiovascular uh, mortality. This is detrimental cause. This is heart failure. And really, you can see that it had a really dramatic impact on cardiovascular outcomes, including reducing um, heart failure. And for a while, until the other trials come, came out, we didn't know if this was a unique thing to this one drug or if it was a class effect. It turns out it's a class effect because other SGLT2 inhibitors also show um, the same significant um, benefit in terms of cardiovascular death um, and, and, and heart failure hospitalizations as, 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 as shown here. So the question then is, why does this class of drugs actually have this significant benefit in terms of um, cardiovascular outcomes and also in terms of heart failure? And the bottom line is, we really don't know. So one of the things about medicine, as I'm sure you know, is that the less you know about something, the more sometimes it gets written about it in, in reviews and opinions and perspectives and hypothesis papers and so forth. And so if you go on PubMed and you ask about, you know, if you Google or you PubMed, heart failure and SGLT, you're going to see a lot of papers written by a lot of people with relatively little data. But with that said, there are a number of hypotheses that have been generated to account for this cardiovascular benefit. I'm summarizing them on this slide. Obviously, there are, there are renal effects related to the diuresis, the natriuresis, reduction of um, intraglomerular hypertension. There's evidence of vascular effects. There's also evidence of metabolic effects. Um, one that's been talked about quite a bit is that when you're on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you have a slight increase in ketones. It turns out the heart likes ketones if you give it ketones to eat. And, and it may be a more metabolic fuel than fatty acids. Um, but all of these effects are relatively small. So whether or not it's a combination of multiple small effects, that's then having the, 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 the positive benefit at this point is, is unclear. But we do have the very powerful data from the clinical trials that have you know, shown this, 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 this very powerful and consistent benefit. So just to summarize then what we know about heart failure in these outcomes trials, so again, difficult slide three, but this, this is a summary of the DPP-4 inhibitor trials. The bottom line is that no real um, effect to reduce heart failure. If anything, it, it might tend to increase it. With regards to the GLP-1 receptor um, agonists, these are four trials um, summarized here. The net effect is neutral on, on heart failure. And then the SGLT-2 inhibitors, um, the net effect is a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalization relative to the other classes. So this is nice, but you know, what about older agents? 
So for those of you who read the annals, I know all the residents back here read the annals every week when it comes out, or every month when it comes out, but in a recent annals, there was a position statement um, by the WHO looking at um, intensification of therapy in type 2 diabetes, a global perspective. Because it's all well and good to be able to write a prescription for SGLT2 inhibitors here, which are expensive drugs, or GLP-1 is a drug agonist here. But if you're practicing in South America or you're practicing in Asia or in Sub-Saharan Sub Sub Africa, you pretty much have metformin, sulfonylureas, and probably human insulin. And so they, they, their recommendation was based on the available evidence that at, at a global level, those agents work, and you know, whether or not they, uh, we should be investing large amounts of money on some of these new agents in these um, resource challenge, challenge environments to reduce cardiovascular outcomes is at this point not clear, because remember, many of these trials were done in, in, in Western societies. But with that said, is there any information about these older agents and heart failure? Now, nobody's going to do a cardiovascular outcomes trial on metformin. It's generic. And nobody's going to do a cardiovascular outcome trial on sulfonylureas. They are generic. And so what that forces us in the field to do is to do kind of large-scale population lookbacks or surveys to try to glean um, information as to what, what, what might be having an effect. And so I think one of, these, one of the best studies I came across is this one by... Um, Hippisley Cox and colleagues in the UK um, looking at the National Health Service. And they were able to look at um, 500,000 patients with a diagnosis of diabetes and followed over a course of eight years. This is a very busy study, but I'm going to highlight a few things there. But they looked at their therapy. They were either on monotherapy, shown here with metformin, sulfonylureas, insulin, TZDs, um, and DPP4 inhibitors, or two-drug two therapy or triple therapy. So the first thing I want to point out, I want to get your attention to is in this heart failure column. And if you first of all look at insulin as a monotherapy, um, it looked like with this analysis, again, lots of patients, again, it's not a prospective randomized trial, so there are, are caveats to these data, but nevertheless, it looked like for those people who are on insulin alone, there was an increased risk of heart failure. For those people who are on metformin, there was a reduced risk of, of, of heart failure. And um, if you looked at dual treatment, one of the things you'll notice is that if you look, for example, at sulfonylureas or insulin, and then you add metformin to any of these, there's a reduction. Whereas if there are, if there are, if there are um, combinations that lack metformin, then, for example, sulfonylureas, and insulin and sulfonylureas and other drugs, it looks like there is a, 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 a trend towards increase. And then in all of the triple arms, they all had metformin, and it looks like in this population study, there might have been a benefit. So the message then is that you know, metformin um, is quite safe in the heart failure population and probably has a benefit. And this has been, in fact, been studied in a, couple of, um, a number of trials summarized here, looking at um, patients with heart failure and all-cause mortality in people with or without metformin. And you can see from these uh, meta-analyses shown here that um, being on metformin has a positive benefit in individuals who have diabetes and, and, and heart failure. And also, that's also true when one looks at um, readmission to the hospital um, for heart failure as well. So the take-home messages so far is that, number one, diabetes increases heart failure risk. Uh, metformin is likely to be cardioprotective in the context of, of heart failure. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are not inferior in CV outcomes trials. Um, the long-term impact of DPP-4 inhibitors on heart failure risk is unclear. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, specifically liraglutide in particular, and SGLT2 inhibitors, both EMPA and cannabiflosin, um, exhibit superiority in composite endpoints, but only SGLT2 inhibitors um, reduce the risk of, of heart failure. So if one summarizes then kind of the relationship between diabetes therapies and heart failure, then I think they, the clear kind of ones that provide benefit are shown here. And if we were to drill down into, the, into the, the data, the evidence is mixed in this column with some of these agents um, um, suggesting evidence um, of harm. 
So then here's the other question. What is known about the use of some of these newer agents in patients with existing heart failure? So this is a work in progress. So of course, with the very dramatic results that came out from the studies of SGLT2 inhibitors, then there are now a, a number of prospective trials of SGLT2 inhibitors in looking specifically at individuals with heart failure at the time of randomization in, in the, into the trial to look at outcomes. So not much is known, but there is a couple of trials that have been coming out now. And this is one that came out recently looking at liraglutide. And what this, the way that this was designed was the entry point was heart failure. And then you were, the patients were randomized or not to liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Small study, but um, in patients who were randomized to liraglutide, there was actually a signal for increased death or rehospitalization for heart failure or uh, emergency room visit in heart failure patients who were placed on liraglutide. And if you, if you actually look at, the, at who were, what was driving this difference, in fact, it were the patients with diabetes. So this was the total study population, a trend towards an increased risk in the liraglutide um, treatment. When the data was analyzed, looking at patients without diabetes or patients with diabetes, in fact, this, this was really completely driven by, um, by individuals who, who were diabetic. So again, it's a cautionary note that although if you take individuals who are at high risk for a future cardiovascular event and you give them liraglutide, the cardiovascular outcomes trials would suggest that there will be a benefit. However, if you take patients with existing heart failure and you put them on, liraglu on, on liraglutide, the jury is still out in terms of what the impact will be on their heart failure. So where this is leading us in as a field is that um, one now really has to consider and incorporate an assessment of cardiovascular disease risk in your therapeutic decision making when you're managing somebody with um, type 2 diabetes. And this is a table that I took from a, a review by Dr. Sheen published in Circulation Research where he really just attempted to kind of capture this, not sure I agree with his hemoglobin A1C target, but, but he's trying to capture this in terms of, you know, a decision for monotherapy versus multiple therapy, and that um, if you're going to go with a, a something to be added onto metformin, then you will have to really ask the question, what is this individual's cardiovascular risk, number one, and then number two is, do they have heart failure, yes or no? Because if they have heart failure, you may probably want to avoid a DPP-4 inhibitor based on what the, the, the clinical trials have taught us. Um, you may want to favor going with an SGLT2 inhibitor. But of course, remember that the clinical trials are still being done. So we might be surprised with the outcomes or we might be happy with the outcomes when those results become, become available. But as of now, um, I think the, 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 the teaching point, particularly for the residents, is you really have to assess cardiovascular risk as you escalate therapy um, in your patients with uh, type 2 diabetes. So the question then is, what are we missing? I mean, why is it so hard to kind of fix the heart in the context of, of, of type 2 diabetes? I mean, we have many ways to lower glucose. We have good drugs to reduce cholesterol. We can, you know, reduce vascular disease to a certain extent. So why are we still having this struggle with, um, with heart failure? And I think that the concept I want to leave you with is that um, when one looks at some of these trials, it is possible that there are other confounding factors which impact the relationship between glycemic control and heart failure. And this is sort of summarized here um, by Deepak back a few years ago, where he suggested that it could be that in these trials, it could be non therapy effects, so something else is going on in the patients that's making their heart failure worse. It could be the therapy itself, which could be either having an effect on volume, and I think the classic example of that are TZDs, or it could be something, a direct effect um, on the heart of, of, of these treatments. But I think that there's another thing that I want to have you think about, is that we believe that there probably is a cardiomyopathy of obesity and diabetes. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the diabetic milieu um, leads to intrinsic defects in cardiac muscle that increases the likelihood that cardiac dysfunction will develop in the context of added stressors such as ischemia or cardiac hypertrophy. 
So what is the evidence for that? I think there's a lot of evidence, but let me show you evidence from a very beautiful epidemiologic study. That is the ERIC study that was published by Elizabeth Selvin at Hopkins. So this is a large population study of cardiovascular risk. And um, what Elizabeth did was she went back to the freezer and um, she measured something called the highly sensitive troponin. So, you know, when somebody comes into the ER with chest pain, you're going to rule them out, you measure troponin. But it's not the highly sensitive troponin, it's troponin, right? And so what this is measuring are what we'd call really subclinical myocardial damage that wouldn't even meet the diagnostic threshold for um, ischemic injury. But with this highly sensitive assay, she showed a couple of things. First of all, if you took individuals in this large cohort study and stratified them by the absence of diabetes or the presence of prediabetes or the presence of diabetes, that in fact, there was a significant correlation between um, diabetes diagnosis and the ability to, de to detect a troponin leak. Um, in these otherwise healthy individuals. And then when she then looked at that and then looked at risk of either cardiovascular death or heart failure, again, the results were very dramatic. So she arbitrarily divided the population into no elevation, which is less than 40 nanograms per liter or higher than 40 nanograms per liter, and asked the question, first of all, those with the higher levels had more events, both in terms of cardiovascular death or heart failure, but even at the subclinical levels or whatever this, 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 that, that this cut off, that being diabetic still had higher levels and also increased the risk of, of, of an event. So what I believe this is really telling us is that um, there is kind of a slow burn, as it were, happening to the heart in the context of diabetes. And this, in fact, I think is making the heart that much more vulnerable to injury. Now, in the lab, my group and many other groups have spent many years trying to understand what are the mechanisms that actually lead to this increase in um, injury in the heart. And so this cartoon summarizes like it's everything. In other words, you know, it's what I call that death by a thousand flogs, that all of these pathways summarized in this cartoon have been implicated in increasing the risk of or the vulnerability of the diabetic heart to injury. And I'll just pause it here so you can pick your favorite pathway. Then I'm going to show you a couple of slides on one of our pathways that we're interested on. That, but it doesn't mean that it's the only pathway, it's just the one that we have funding to work on. Um, so we, for example, spend a lot of time working on mitochondria um, in the heart. And what we and others have shown, both in animal models of diabetes as well as in uh, humans, um, with diabetes is that there is a defect in the mitochondria in the hearts of individuals with diabetes and, and obesity that ultimately leads or is associated with an increased utilization of fatty acids as a fuel, um, increased delivery of these reducing equivalents to mitochondria, which has an impaired electron transport chain. And this reduction in the oxidative phosphorylation capacity of the heart, among us other things, leads to an overproduction of um, reactive oxygen species or superoxide and leads to oxidative stress and oxidative damage of mitochondria, um, proteins involved in myocardial contraction, proteins involved in myocardial calcium handling, for example. And also, this defect in energy metabolism within the heart limits the energetic reserve of the heart. Remember, the human heart is a, mus is a muscular pump that doesn't have the option to rest when it's, stopped, when it, when it's tired from working out. The residents call it a code, right? And so, so it, the human heart actually turns over up to 79 kilograms of ATP per day. It's a lot of ATP. A lot of mitochondria. You're working really hard. And so if you have a condition where you're now beginning to limit the efficiency with, with, his, with, with which his mitochondria generate ATP, you can therefore see that when you add a stress, then the, the, the buffer zone, as it were, is a little bit narrower, and therefore the likelihood of failure occurring um, is um, um, increasing. So this is one mechanism which we think is happening. Another one is insulin. Remember I said earlier that in the one of these studies, insulin use was associated with an increased risk of heart failure. Well, it turns out, um, and I'm going to summarize a lot of work here in this one cartoon, that if you are hyperinsulinemic and if your heart is failing and your myocytes is stretching, 
a stretched cardiac myocyte also activates insulin signaling pathways. So you have two hits, the stretch and the insulin, and this acts via the insulin receptors to increase signaling through something called IRS1, AKT, and will increase um, ventricular remodeling. So to prove that it was true, we made a mouse where we prevented signaling through this protein called IRS1, or insulin receptor substrate 1. And we can bring about heart failure in a mouse by essentially tying an autoimmune the aorta called um, transverse aortic constriction, or like a, a surgical ligation of the aorta. The hearts get hypertrophied, and then they fail. They get fibrotic. And what you can see here in this histology picture is that this, if you take a wild-type animal and do this surgery, after two weeks, they have all this fibrosis in their heart. If you take a IRS2 deficient mouse and do this surgery, they have all this fibrosis in their heart. Take an IRS1 deficient mouse and do this surgery, their hearts are perfectly fine. And what this really tells us, and again, I'm just showing you one slide from a lot of work here, is that overactivation of the insulin signaling pathway in a stressed heart actually can lead to increased damage in that stressed heart. And so what this cartoon is showing then is that we believe that a hyperinsulinemia combined with myocyte stretch through these um, signaling intermediates will um, aggravate cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, aggravate mitochondrial dysfunction, increase um, cell death, and increase angiogenesis, which will accelerate um, left ventricular remodeling. And in other work, which I won't show you the primary data for, um, in models of um, diet-induced um, obesity and type 2 diabetes and heart failure, we've also shown that in addition to that, there are other signaling pathways. This one in particular, which is um, uh, the GRK2 signaling, also becomes increased in its activation, which also leads to changes within the heart that promotes um, heart failure. So if you don't remember anything else, I think that um, in the context of heart failure, hyperinsulinemia by activating both direct as well as aberrant signaling pathways can aggravate the hypertrophic response and some of the cell death pathways that may occur in the context of the failing heart. So we have a scenario then where we have many agents now available in our clinical armamentarium that um, we can use to treat diabetes. They have multiple modes um, of action. They're all effective to lower hemoglobin A1C um, in patients who are compliant with them and compliant with that, et cetera. But their effects on heart failure um, is variable. And so I think that where the future is, in my, in my opinion, in the field, is that as we understand many of these other um, pathophysiologic events which are occurring in the heart, in the diabetic milieu, then I believe that targeting some of these agents potentially um, will then enable us potentially to move the needle on heart failure in type 2 diabetes in addition to what we need to do in terms of um, lowering glucose control. So the last slide then I want to just leave you with is, so, you know, what are the current guidelines for treating heart failure in diabetes patients? And this is from, from this is the Canadian guideline, which I thought was, was, was very nicely summarized. So the bottom line is, you treat diabetes with heart failure the same way the same way that you treat non-diabetics with heart failure. Um, and that's the, the evidence would suggest that. The second point is that unless metformin is contraindicated, you don't want to stop metformin in your heart failure patients because the clinical trials evidence would suggest that, in fact, being on metformin offers cardioprotection in the context of, of, of heart failure. Of course, you're going to avoid TZDs in patients um, with heart failure because of the fluid retention that occurs in individuals with TZDs. Beta blockers are, are okay in heart failure and diabetes. When I was in medical school in the last century, people said, well, you don't give beta blockers to diabetics because they won't sense hyperglycemia. Well, that's probably not true, especially if they have heart failure. They will benefit from beta blockade. Um, and then in terms of um, the, 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 the new agents, that the recommendation is to consider adding a SGLT2 inhibitor if the renal function is good, if, if the GFR is above 30 mils um, per minute. And of course, ACEs and ARBs, et cetera, um, remain um, the drugs of choice in individuals with um, diabetes and heart failure. So 
in my institution, we have just decided to give MOCs for medicine grand rounds because um, you know, we're all burdened with too much stuff, including MOC. Um, and, so, and so I have four questions I'm going to ask the residents in my next slide to make sure that you are paying attention. That's why I want you to come to the front. Okay, so question number one, and I'll have a show of hands, is um, the risk of heart failure is greater in females than males. True or false? So who says true? Okay, all right. That's one MOC point. My wife just had to give MOC for this. Okay, next question. Um, heart failure and diabetes occurs exclusively on the basis of coronary atherosclerosis. I like this interactive system. Okay, next question. Um, metformin is contraindicated in heart failure. Okay, next question. Um, approximately what percent of hospitalized patients with heart failure are diabetic? Okay, and then the last question is, um, for which two classes of diabetes therapies listed below is the evidence strongest for a potential benefit in reducing the incidence of heart failure? Two and? Four. Okay, with that I end. Thank you. Dale, yeah, that was great. You're much more cooperative with you than they are. <laughs> We'll open it up for some, some questions, Dr. Bernal Mazrafi. Uh, I just wanted to see if you can speculate on the mechanism for metformin. So we know that one of the activation or one of the mechanisms is activated by MPK and that can be modulated in the sinus. So what is the mechanism? Sure. So the question from um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Rachi is um, to speculate on the, the mechanism of the, ben the potential benefit of metformin. Um, in the heart. So one of the effects of metformin at high dose is to activate AMP kinase. Um, and this is probably also true in the heart, at least in animals, animal studies. So what AMP kinase does is that it increases glucose uptake in the heart. It may also um, have other um, benefits that may antagonize, for example, some of the growth promoting effects of, of insulin signaling. Um, there is, I'm aware of one published study looking specifically at an AMPK, a direct AMPK agonist in an animal study of diabetic cardiomyopathy and showed, showed a benefit. The downside of that in terms of you know, what pharma has found when they, when they look at this, which is that many of these agents which activate AMPK, not metformin, but other agents, also cause some cardiac hypertrophy. And that terrifies pharma because you know, cardiac hypertrophy is viewed as a risk for heart failure. The trouble is we don't know if it's good or bad hypertrophy, right? So if you exercise, you get hypertrophy. Lance Armstrong has a big heart, at least when he was cycling, right? So, so, that's, you know, so, so athletes have what we call a physiologic hypertrophy. So whether or not the signal that was seen in these preclinical trials with these NPK activators is, is, is pathological or physiological, we don't know, but the trouble is if you're the CEO of a big pharma company, you kill the program because you just don't want any, any signal that potentially could have you know, an, an adverse effect. But to answer your question, I mean, I think it's partly a mitochondrial effect, partly an anti apoptotic effect, and probably also an effect to, to antagonize pro-hypertrophic signals. In terms of other macrovascular complications, is there any evidence that any of these drugs are more helpful in stroke? versus uh, heart disease? Good question. So if you look very carefully at these cardiovascular outcomes trials um, and then drill below this, this, this composite endpoint of major adverse cardiovascular events, yes, there are different signals in, in, in MIs versus um, strokes. So for example, even in the GLP-1 receptor agonist um, studies, in one trial, I can't remember exactly, what, exactly which one, the, a big driver of the improvement was a reduction in stroke. But in another trial, in fact, there's slightly more strokes, but less MIs. So, 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 so looking at, you know, below the MACE line to actually look at which, what was driving that MACE score is important depending on, on, on your patient. The other point I'd make as well in that, in that um, regard, Dr. Weiss, is that, you know, um, TZDs, which actually have gotten a bad rap because of um, rosiglitazone and they, 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 those they studies, but... If you actually look at the one study, which I kind of went through kind of quickly on that um, 
half a million people in the UK, in, in, again, people in the community without heart disease, there's actually a benefit of being on a TCD, number one. And then there's a nice study that was done out of, out of the, the, the Yale group looking at individuals who had a TIA um, who tend to be insulin resistant, and they were randomized or not to PIO. And in fact, those on PIO had a, a, a reduced risk of a subsequent cerebrovascular ischemic event. So, so um, I think you know, we have to sort of step back and really look very closely now on each of our patients in terms of you know, risk stratification vis-a-vis -vis therapeutic choice as it, as it relates to, to, to diabetes. One from the chief resident and one from the back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So great talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure listening to you. Um, now with all of the evidence of the, um, how, of, of the good evidence with SGLT2 in patients with diabetes and heart failure, there's been a lot of discussions on who should prescribe these drugs. Yes. Should it be limited just to endocrinologists, or should it be something that should be, you know, amplified to the cardiovascular community and maybe even primary care? Do you think that these drugs are drugs that are meant only to be prescribed by endocrinologists, or if we see patients in our clinic that have diabetes and heart failure, is that something that we should Right, so you ask a loaded question, because <laughs> if, if you actually look at the marketing strategy for SGLT2s, it's being marketed primarily to primary care physicians. Um, if you go to the HA meeting, cardiologists happen for Eugene Braunwald, the storied chair of medicine, has said publicly, and I'm an I'm like, I said, don't say it. He says, he says the you know, cardiovascular disease in the last century was all about atherosclerosis. In the 21st century, it's, it's now cardiometabolic. So endocrinologists, watch out. The cardiologists are trying to take us over. <laughs> Okay, um, so, so, so there has been you know, significant interest within the cardiovascular clinical community um, in adding these agents to the Harris patients with diabetes. I think there, there, there is still some caution because remember, there's always some risk in extrapolating from a, a cardiovascular outcomes trial from a very clearly prescribed group to everyone. Um, and you know, I think time will tell, for example, if patients, say, with existing heart failure will in fact benefit from these agents, we actually don't know. And then the other thing, too, is that you know, managing diabetes is, is complex. It's not just lowering the sugar. It's not just putting someone in a drug that will, will, will reduce their, their risk of, of, of a long-term event. So a long answer to your question is, my view is that these agents should be prescribed in a, a multidisciplinary context where you, the endos are talking to the cardiovascular folks and somebody's like paying attention to the patient sort of holistically. These are incredibly expensive drugs. And um, you know, as we think about you know, risk versus benefits plus cost versus, ver versus benefits, the jury's still out, in my opinion, in terms of you know, a lot of patients who present early with few initial risks with um, type 2 diabetes, if you manage many of these other aspects of their disease and metabolism, they may never even get to a point where they need to be even to be having this conversation. The risk is that everybody will say, well, diabetes gives you so many sort of CV risk points, so therefore let's put you on an SGLT2 inhibitor. I think that's probably a little bit dangerous, a little bit premature. And um, you know, maybe five years from now, we'll have a lot more clarity in terms of where these agents fall within, within the therapeutic spectrum. Long to your question, I'm a, I'm a politician. So your question <laughs> was, who should prescribe them? I guess if you pin me down, I would say they probably should be prescribed by specialists. Dr. Mahars. So in my field of hospital medicine, in perioperative medicine, biomarkers are becoming a more interesting topic. When you risk stratify somebody for going to non-cardiac surgery, according to the ACC algorithm, if they're an intermediate risk, and then their pro BNP is elevated, we actually raise their risk and think of them a little bit more critically. I'm kind of curious if studying some of these agents over a long period of time with something that we order frequently, a pro BNP, and seeing the, the relationship with the hemoglobin A1C, if that would help you with respect to the efficacy of these agents and the mechanism. Because if I'm hearing things, it's still just not quite clear. Yes, that, that's, that's an excellent question. So I'm going to kind of almost rephrase your question a little bit, which is, um, Diabetes is common. Heart failure is even more common if, 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 if you're a diabetic. Um, oftentimes, it's subclinical. 
Um, and now, how do you kind of decide who is at risk? So people have been actually doing trials, looking both at um, um, echocardiography with um, strain and, uh, um, and spectral analysis to try to look at diastolic function as an early indicator. People are also looking at measuring pro-BNP to actually have a sense for the risk of heart failure in asymptomatic patients who have um, diabetes. And yes, if you look for it, you're going to find people with elevated pro-BNPs. What we don't know is what to do with them, right? Because do you then say, OK, um, this, this, this particular cohort at high risk, do we therefore essentially jump all over them with everything that we know is cardioprotective, make sure that the cholesterol is OK, their, 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 their blood pressure is optimized, their glucose control is optimized, um, and what will the outcome be? Or do we put them on an SGLT2 inhibitor? And see, we actually don't know. Um, at this point yet, what to do with that information, except that those patients get watched a bit more closely, and that if, in fact, you have to escalate therapy um, for their diabetes, you might choose an agent that might have more likelihood of cardiovascular benefit than one, than, than one where it's less clear. But that's kind of where we are at this point. I mean, I think we're just only at the beginning of this, and I think the next five to 10 years are going to be really very, both exciting and interesting as we start to sort out some of these, I think, very, very practical questions. Dr. Abel, thank you for a fantastic interview. Thank you. You're welcome.